All right. Well, thanks to everybody who took on the challenge of reading today. Uh, last minute. I appreciate it. Um, this week we're starting a five-week series on the story of Joseph. And I mentioned this last week, and as you just heard, it is a story that is full of drama and passion and has some important things to say about God and about how God can be at work in our lives. So I hope you'll leave this week ready to hear more of what's next. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, help us find ourselves in the midst of your story. Open our ears, our minds, our hearts, our lives to your touch. You are the one who knows our own stories so well. Give us strength to follow the path you call us to. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, families. The idea of a family is a good one, of course, right? People you're related to, helping you grow up into a responsible citizen. Caring for you and teaching you right from wrong, love and justice. What it means to live a good life. Family is the people who have your back, a refuge and a foundation when times get tough, and the people we're responsible for, too, so that we're tethered to the world, not drifting and purposeless. That's how it's supposed to work, anyway. And tradition, handing things down, is a big part of what it means to be family. We might get a big, strong, a big sense of loyalty, a gift for languages, our peculiar sense of humor. The ability to make friends with total strangers, or perhaps, most importantly, our sense of faith and connection to God. And it all comes from relatives we loved and watched closely and learned from. Of course, sometimes the thing you inherit is totally random. Uh, When I was growing up, I noticed that sometimes my dad would uh, be sitting there quietly, and then he would just laugh out loud for no reason, apparently. Just laugh out loud to himself. And I always thought that was weird. I was like, why... Why is Dad doing that? Uh, Until I started doing it too. And then a couple of years ago, I was talking to my little sister, and she does the same thing. But when we do it, it makes total sense, okay? So, So there are traditions and talents and oddities that make their way down the family tree. But we know, too, that other things can come down the family tree and sometimes poison family life. Abuse and addiction, medical problems, depression, manipulation, you name it. The list goes on. Sometimes the values parents want to teach their children get overshadowed overshadowed by something bigger and more powerful, some sin in our lives that we can't be freed from and that creeps into our families, whether we want it there or not. Which is what we see happening today in our story from Genesis about Israel and his sons. Israel's past, his history of jealousy, of trickery and manipulation, get passed down to the next generation and come back to haunt him as well. Israel was born as Jacob, and he got that name, which means heel, as the heel of your foot, because he was the second born twin, born holding onto the heel of his older brother Esau. But Jacob didn't accept being second born, he was jealous. And he manipulated his brother into giving away his birthright and tricked his father into giving him the blessing that should have gone to Esau. And then he ran away from home when his brother became murderously angry about it. Now Israel has returned to the lands promised to his grandfather Abraham, had something of an ambiguous reunion with his twin Esau, and has been living there with his four wives, twelve sons, and at least one daughter, although it sounds like there's more and the flocks and herds of a wealthy man. Joseph, his second youngest son, is his favorite, and he gives him a beautiful coat and sets Joseph up as a middle manager, supervising his older brothers at their sheep herding jobs, which in some families would be uh, annoying. But in this family, jealousy runs hot and thick. The brothers hate Joseph for the favoritism, for the love that Israel shows him, but not them. That's where it starts, with jealousy. So much jealousy that they give Joseph the silent treatment, which doesn't stop him from talking to them about his dreams, dreams that will, he'll rule over them, dreams that he believes will come true. Those dreams do come true, but not in the way that Joseph expected. But that's for another Sunday. 
For today we're seeing one family twisted up and burning with jealousy, with manipulation, with deceit. And the brothers who should be protecting and teaching their little brother instead nearly kill him and in the end sell him into slavery. So where is God in all of this? In a few weeks we'll hear from Joseph his reflections on the whys and the wherefores of his journey. But today I'd like to suggest that God is working on this family and trying to work out the sin that is in them, the violence, the callousness, the jealousy of the brothers. This family, after all, is going to become God's chosen people, the people who will show the world what God's grace is about, the people who will bring God's healing and love and salvation to the whole world. And this jealousy is a family tradition that can't be passed down. God is working through Reuben, who keeps the brothers from killing Joseph immediately, even though his overall plan to keep Joseph safe doesn't quite pan out. And God is working through Judah, even if it seems like maybe we can take Judah at his word, that he figures if Joseph is going to suffer, it's better to sell him and get a little profit than to kill him and get nothing out of it. Nice guy, right? Does that mean Joseph wanted to, uh, does that mean God wanted Joseph sold into slavery? I don't think so, but sometimes God just has to work with what we give her. And in this case, the brothers had jealousy and murder in their hearts. So God turned it into an unlikely escape. Joseph lived and God was with him, even in the worst of circumstances, as we shall see in coming weeks. Sometimes people describe church or their church as a family. And in some ways, a church is like a family. We come together to learn how to love each other. And at the same time, for the most part, you don't get to pick who is in your family and who is in your church. Uh, One time a pastor named Martin Copenhaver asked his congregation to raise their hands if there was someone in the congregation that they just couldn't stand, if there was someone that they would never voluntarily spend a minute with, much less an hour. And then once people had their hands raised, he said, if you don't have a hand raised, you're not involved enough yet. (laughs) Churches uh, can have all the traditions, quirks, and oddities good and bad, that families can have. And yet you might be surprised to know that a church as a family is not actually an image in the Bible. Instead, Paul tells us that the church is a body, the body of Christ, that we may be strangers or the best of friends or the best of frenemies, for that matter, but we come together as a body, as an embodiment of Christ. We are Christ's hands and feet, guided and enlivened by the Holy Spirit to do God's work in the world. When we take the communion bread, when we drink from the common cup, we become or we memorialize becoming part of Christ's body, brought together for a common purpose, to watch for, to call attention to, and to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. This is our holy calling. May we answer with love and with courage. By God's grace. Amen.